So um, my name is Joe Breen. I, I work at the NIH, as um, Olaf outlined, and I just want to start off by saying um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here and for giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what uh, the NIH is doing more recently for MECFS. Um, and it's been a real privilege to be here in Norway for a few days and especially to be here this afternoon. So an outline uh, is here. I want to tell you a little bit about how we're organized at NIH and in this uh, around MECFS and a recent report um, from an external group helping to calibrate us into areas that are important both to the researchers uh, and to the public and how we really need to put that together uh, for a strategy uh, moving forward. Um, and I'm going to talk about a very interesting study that was started last year that is actually being done at NIH uh, exclusively with a, a longitudinal study for MECFS uh, sufferers. It's, it's enrolling now. I don't have results to report, but I think the design uh, should be interesting. And then I want to talk about the work that we have recently funded across the U.S. Uh, with uh, international collaborators. Uh, what we call the Collaborative Research Centers, and uh, actually uh, Dr. Betsy Keller, who you, you will hear from uh, next, is part of, of one of these efforts. So I won't go into her area, but um, I'll tell you a little bit about the things that we're doing and, and a little bit about some uh, early results. It's about two years in. And we have recent Canadian partners, which we're very uh, excited about. So how, how does NIH um, really a attack MECFS? So there are 27 institutes and centers at NIH. I work at the Allergy Immunology um, and Transplantation Branch in, um, in really what we call NIID, so it's infectious diseases uh, primarily. But um, MECFS covers a, a large range of symptoms, sometimes more neurological, sometimes really uh, virological studies. Those studies about the virology and the potential etiology of MECFS would be assigned to me, actually, and I would oversee those uh, studies, whereas I have colleagues in the Neurological Institute that would handle uh, grants in that area. So that it's really the responsibilities are divided by the subject area of an applicant who's funded uh, for work. That kind of work is really done primarily with a five-year award or a two-year award. And we have a number of these projects uh, in any given time um, ongoing in MECFS, some in my institute, some in the Neurological Institute. But I'm really, I, I just want you to know that there is ongoing efforts, um, but I'm going to highlight a new effort with the Collaborative Research Centers, a five-year program that was started in 2017. So um, there is a trans-NIH working group, again, because this is a multidisciplinary uh, disease requires expertise from immunology to protein biology, cytokines, um, and a whole range of neurological expertise as well. So we work together in a team. And I, my job is really as a program official is to help people who are trying to come in with ideas and get them funded, as well as manage grants once they're supported, as well as identify new opportunities and gaps and potentially write funding announcements so that people will fill those gaps. And the people like me are called program officers, and I work very closely with Dr. Vicki Whittemore at NIH, who heads this trans-NIH group uh, of program officers in MECFS. There are actually 22 different people like us that work together in this group, but it's primarily led officially by Dr. Walter Korschetz, who heads the entire um, Neurological Disorders and Stroke uh, Institute, and Vicki and I, mostly because these grants really are, end up being our responsibility, pretty much 50-50, um, with a little bit of work outside of those areas. So in, there's been, for 20 years, we've had a group organized at NIH in this area, and it was led uh, for much of that time by the Office of Research and Women's Health. But in 2015, Dr. Francis Collins, who's the director of the NIH, 
really decided that this needed more attention. It needed uh, more direct attention in one of the scientific institutes. So at that time, he said, we're going to reinvigorate this. And he assigned Dr. Walter Korshetz to lead this committee. And that's about the time that I switched positions and became involved in, um, in my new immunological job at uh, NIID. And I uh, assumed the role for MECFS. And we very quickly came together and decided we needed to fund some new work, bring in new people to the MECF field using what we call supplements to ongoing projects, and then started this new program in 2017 where we really wanted research centers to collaborate and begin, begin to form a network and be able to utilize strengths across this network. And ultimately, you know, we're recruiting patients that then could be shared across this network to really synergize the science as much as possible. And we we do this from a programmatic, so a liaison, a helpful point of view from the NIH, but we also need to take input from the public and the community. And there was a recent uh, report that was generated from actually a, a group of patients, patient advocacy organizations in, in the U.S. and MECFS, as well as um, experts in the field in the academics um, and government, and then people like myself, a year-long process to help identify gaps and opportunities. And they actually delivered a report to uh, Dr. Walter Korshetz. And the, in that report, there were some key areas. We needed, to, we needed to create a research strategic plan and not just really let science come in uh, more passively and form an interagency group to take advantage of other areas beyond NIH. Are there, for example, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which is usually involved in epidemiology, they have a lot of expertise and a long-standing expertise in this area, and we want to work closely with them, and we need to collaborate with them, and we, we are actually doing that now. And we need to outreach to bring in new ideas. The field needs new stimulation and younger people and actually outside expertise that should be applied. Uh, and of course, we need to really bring people in and decrease the stigma around the disease, which is one of the reasons why we hosted a large international meeting on the NIH campus in April of 2019, which was really uh, the first events of its kind in probably five or six years to bring some attention to, to this uh, disease. And so we are working through some of these steps through this trans-NIH working group, and I hope you'll see some output from that in the coming uh, years. So the intramural study, so there's really two types of work at NIH. There's the work done at NIH, which is actually only 15% of the overall work that the NIH supports. The other 85 is all across the country and, and, and the world. But sometimes there are unique projects that are done at the NIH, and this is one, where the idea is to explore the clinical and biological phenotypes of post-infectious MECFS. And it's very uh, tightly designed to, dis to explore pathophysiologies of fatigue and post-exertional malaise, and PEM, as, as we're talking about here. And this is a unique opportunity, uh, which was started in 2017, to really to do the first uh, objective and hopefully we can do some of these secondary objectives um, using uh, PEM, which you'll hear um, some ex externally funded work from Dr. Keller. And there's, this work is also ongoing in this um, scheme and in this intramural study. And ideally, we'd love to develop an experimental model for post-infectious MECFS because right now we don't have such a thing. So the protocol is such that um, we require MECFS patients. We're using um, a, a large uh, study population initially. I'm going to go into that in the next slide. And it's been uh, challenging but successful to date to get patients that fit this post-infectious definition. So they need a verifiable infec um, acute infectious disease as uh, really with documentation provided by a physician, and then onset of uh, post-exertional malaise and fatigue 
um, more than six months, but less than five years. So that's important, uh, less than five years. And meet the MECF case definitions, the FACUDA, the Canadian, and the IOM definition. And once we have these patients, they're educated with a panel of experts who are outside NIH and we're extremely dependent upon to help us uh, make these choices. The study design is that we all have 40 MECFS patients, 40 healthy controls, and 20 uh, comparators of post-Lyme disease without uh, fatigue. So this is a little bit of a status update. So we've had 438 inquiries, screened out 237. Dr. Brian Wallet, who's the associate investigator for this study, has personally interviewed 206, and after looking at medical records, have screened um, out 144. So the, we've so far have done phenotyping visit on 25 healthy volunteers and 26 ME-CFS patients, 17 of which have been educated by the clinical panel I, I mentioned. And uh, much fewer have completed the exercise visit, which is a very extensive deep phenotyping, which I'll show you the next slide. Um, but we do anticipate that they, they will complete this uh, deep phenotyping, uh, all 26. So I don't want you to leave with the idea that we've only gotten six. The 26 will go through this process, which is really unique, I think, to a place um, at NIH where we can do all the things that are, are listed here. So we're really basically looking at every biological measurement that we can to try and better characterize at least this narrow section of the post-MECFS uh, population with the hope that we will uh, really understand and get biomarkers that are measurably and discreetly different between patients and controls. So then that will help us better understand the disease and of course the, we would love to be able to come up with a therapeutic alternative and and test that. So it's, it, this utilizes all these uh, mitochondrial function, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, very advanced imaging, uh, exercise testing, basically every uh, bodily fluid that you can assess um, to try and find these differences using the expertise. As I mentioned, there's 27 different institutes and centers with very different uh, areas of scientific expertise, and they're all putting them to bear uh, on this question in this study. And so the, they're really about halfway through the selection. Um, this process, is, as I mentioned, is two weeks. So that's the ongoing study, and I expect that we will see publications and uh, findings from this. Um, there's been some interim analysis, but nothing that is really interpretable yet. We need a larger sample pool to responsibly uh, talk about it. So the, the other thing I want to touch on is the collaborative research centers. Uh, there are three research centers, one at Columbia with uh, Dr. Ian Lipkin, who is a world-renowned, uh, really infectious disease, a viral hunter, so to speak. He's looking for every way that in, with his advanced technology to look for a viral, bacterial, or fungal connection to the etiology of the disease, as well as looking at contemporary metabolomics and some biomarkers from clinical metadata, because he actually has the largest uh, sample pool besides what's being collected during this uh, study. The second is um, a newer entry into the MECFS area, Dr. Durya Unamats at Jackson Labs. He's a T cell immunologist. He's looking very deeply into T cell immunology, but also incorporating microbiome studies and metabolomics. As we know that there is a strong microbiome immune connection. And uh, Dr. Maureen Hansen at Cornell is leading a team that's doing very advanced neuroimaging, uh, transcriptomics in a way that hasn't been done before, quite a bit of bioinformatics actually, and then some pre and post exercise studies, some of which you'll hear uh, from uh, Dr. Betsy Keller. And the other unique piece is really uh, the, a data management center where the data from these studies will be um, stored initially and then made publicly available so that we could do cross-center comparisons. And I think over time, this should become a useful community for, uh, for the entire MECFS community, not uh, just these. 
So there are some early results. There are some differences um, in T cell subsets that are uh, under review in a paper from Durya Unitmatz. There, uh, Dr. Maureen Hansen has a paper that's looking at T cell metabolism, uh, which is clearly different between MECF patients and controls. And Dr. Lipkin has actually found some interesting metabolic differences using two different methodologies. So it really was nice cross-validation from metabolomics and then some epigenetic studies. So there's, there's uh, several, I think, um, concrete examples of where we're moving forward, and you should see papers, I think, in, in certainly in the next 12 months and, and more. And I just want to give you a picture of the work that's ongoing uh, inside NIH and outside uh, in this area, and I believe we're going to take questions at the end. And thank you for your attention.